Well, it's good to have. Again, it's good to have all of you here. And uh, praise God for him, for all that the Lord has done in our lives. I rejoice in that. I, uh, I have a special message I'm going to be bringing, not special to me, uh, not just this morning, but next Sunday morning as well. It's out of one of my favorite psalms that spoke to me back in my 20s. And it got to be one of the things that I loved speaking to teenagers about, realizing, though, that really everybody needs to hear it. So I hope and pray that it is a blessing to you. Let's see what the Lord does. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the 73rd Psalm. Psalm 73. The title of the message this morning is When Confidence Collapses. When Confidence Collapses. Next Sunday, the title of the message is, Lord willing, When Confidence Returns. But this morning, when confidence collapses. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. Help us, Lord, settle our hearts now before you. We do truly come to you in worship. We come rejoicing in what you have done for us. So, Lord, open our eyes. We pray for your wisdom. As James tells us, we need to pray for wisdom constantly. So, Lord, give that to us. Give us discernment of your word. And we will give you, as Brother Whiteside says so many times, we will give you all the praise. We pray that you would lift up those that are sick in our local fellowship. Lord, just keep us healthy. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. This psalm, don't look at it right now, look at me. I want to give you a little bit of an introduction. This psalm is known as a psalm of Asaph. Now, to me, this is the thing that has been so fascinating about this psalm. If you have ever read in your Bible as you go through the book of Psalms, you come to Psalm 72 And it says, the Psalms of David are now ended. And then they go on. Now, there are, I believe, a smattering of other Psalms that David wrote later on in the book of Psalms. But this marks a turning point. And the person now that is singing, as it were, to the Lord, as well as instruction, is a man by the name of Asaph. Now, to me, it's most fascinating with this man because of the message that he's going to be giving us in Psalm 73. He was appointed, appointed by David to be in the temple, the one who led the music, the worship. And that's fascinating to me because, again, of what he is saying here. Appointed, a man that is leading in what the Lord is bringing upon David's heart and, yes, others later on. He also served Solomon. So he's not somebody that's just kind of indiscriminate. He has a place of leadership in Israel And there are a multitude of people that look up to him. So please just keep that in mind. Now, are there Psalms that we think of that David wrote that were, oh man, incredible. And he was, of course, the king. Looked up to the, people looked up to the king. Yes, absolutely, those are there. But I want you to catch what we are given by the Lord through Asaph that again teaches us about what takes place here. 
the very first verse is his confidence, Asaph's confidence. Now, before we go in, before we go into that, there's a couple of quotes that I came across in time past. I'd like to give them to you. If you want to write them down, praise God. If not, that's okay. But just keeping this in mind, the most important thing about you is your view of God. And all God's people said, it's the truth. Now, your view of God and what you display in front of others just might be different than what's really in your heart. You know, I don't know if you've realized it. I've realized it more and more in my life. Biblical Christianity continually brings you to a point of transparency where you know, you, you're, you're not lying to each other, you know, about your walk with the Lord or anything. It's like, we, we don't do, you know, some people, hey, brother, how you doing? Fine. I'm doing okay. You're lying. And you know, how, how many of you, when somebody's asked how you're doing, you've lied before? Your view of God is the most important thing about you, which brings us really to the second one, You tell me your view of God, and I will tell you your destiny. I can't remember who it was that said that. But I like those two quotes again in in, in light of what Asaph is going to walk us through. First of all, look at verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such are as of a clean heart. Now, personally, I believe that Asaph gives his conclusion at the beginning of the psalm. I believe that this is where he wound up, and when we get through to the end of this, I believe you'll see that. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. And I believe that when he is saying this, He is speaking by experience. And again, we will see it. When we think about moments that we have in our lives, it's good to identify places where we started walking with the Lord just a little bit more and we look back and we realize, man, God was so good. By the way, is God good? You bet he is. You reflect on the account of God's working in his people with men and women in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you wind up seeing God's care, God's love. It's where we were at last week. John 3, 16 For God so, exactly. And it's the same thing with us. There's a, I I didn't look it up in our hymn book, but there's a song there that, that we sing. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. And he is You rehearse the promises of God in your life and you will walk away singing, God is so good. You reflect on where we were. Again, last Sunday, John 3, 16, and you'll walk away with the same thing, singing, God is so good. You read the accounts of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Daniel, and a multitude of others. You see how God dealt with them even the unnamed people in the Bible, and you'll walk away singing, God is so good. You read of the birth, uh, the birth, the life, the words, the death, and the resurrection of the Savior, and you recognize that through him, we have that salvation. Oh, that's ultimate. God is so good. You read the birth of the church and the letters to those churches, 
that Paul and James and Peter and others wrote. My God is good. We have the instruction that we need because God is more than enough. He's more than enough. This book is more than enough. He gave us everything we need to know. He didn't tell us everything. Lord, what were you doing three trillion years ago? I was doing nothing three trillion years ago because there was no such thing as time. And all of a sudden we go tilt. He gave us what we need to understand. And truly, God is good. That's a joy to know. But you know, like so many of us, we have a conviction, but we can say, you know, <laughs> there, 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 was a, there was a time though, and we maybe begin to share a confession. Maybe, maybe there's something that, you know, we've got to say, you know, I know God is good, but let me tell you about a time. Look at the next phrase, the first phrase of verse two. But as for me, but as for me. You know what I found out? God's people can have a but as for me moment. In fact, we, we might wind up having several. In fact, there might be people here, are you listening? That if you were honest with yourself and with others, you just might be having a but as for me moment right now. If you are, I greatly encourage you, listen, and especially next Sunday. But here was a man, again, stop and think about it. Sometimes we just wind up running through this and, and, and we don't consider what we're reading. The man was a leader. He was appointed by the king. And he comes and to all of Israel and beyond in song. He says this, I've got a confession to make. See, because, <laughs> but as for me, I, you know, God is good to Israel, even, even to such as of a clean heart who have come to him and worship him and have given themselves to him and rejoice in him and thank him for all that he's done. Praise God for all that. But he says, you know what? There was a time. There was a time. Look at the next part of the verse. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Have you ever been in a situation where physically you felt like you were losing your foundation? You know, you're going to slip, you're going to do, you know, something like that. Don't like that because, you know, sometimes it kind of starts going in slow motion. And as you're going down, you're thinking, which bone am I going to break? But what's worse, what's worse is when it's spiritually and mentally and emotionally, where your foundation is disappearing. Now, I, 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 in, I, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, that's not a good feeling to have. Especially, again, give it time as we reflect on, on Asaph and what he went through. But I can tell you personally, I hated that feeling. I hated it. Because you just don't, you, you, it's like, Lord, what's going on? Now, we're gonna be getting into some details when it comes to what Asaph went through. Your situation, if you have one right now or you have one down the road, your situation might wind up being different. But I believe the principles are the same here. I believe that what, 
what you can deduce from here, even though it might not be the same, you're gonna go, yeah, you know, I, I, I hear this. Let me, let me give you a for instance. We're gonna go to verse three. As Asaph is speaking, he tells of a time of, listen, of confusion. And see, that's what happens when we wind up having a situation where there is this time of, we feel like we're losing our footing spiritually. You know, there's, oh man, it's like, Lord, what's happening? It's a time of confusion. His was this, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, for your situation, to generalize it, we might be able to say this. You can read this. <laughs> I thought following God would be better than being a sinner. I thought it would be better. I thought the wages of sin was death. But I turn on my TV and these people are having a ball. It's great. They're making millions and they're cursing God. Lord, what is going on? I've got friends. They're not walking with God. Their language is foul, all this stuff. And again, we're gonna be getting to this, but the point is, I was told by the preacher one time that my sin was bad, it was, it was the way it was affecting me, and indeed, the wages of sin is death, and you'd better get right with God, you better get saved. And I did, and guess what? Life got tough. And all God's people said, that happens, that happens. I got to thinking, remember the story? You, if you wanna to turn to it, you can, it's Matthew 14. It's Peter. Remember Jesus was walking on the, on the water and the, um, when it comes to the disciples, they're in a storm and I mean, it's panic in River City. No, panic in Jerusalem, whatever. When you were. Look at verse 27, if you're there. But straightway Jesus spake unto them and saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And then Peter, I love Peter. Open mouth, insert foot, chew thoroughly. That's me. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. <laughs> I might be with the other 11. Go for it, Peter, you know. Let's walk in faith, you go first. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked in the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? You know what I think we can learn? And I think you find this in several scenarios, several accounts in the Bible. You always do the best when you just keep your eyes on Christ. Now, the wind might be fascinating and then it gets fearful. But the point is this, God is the one that takes us through. Now, if we wanna just keep talking about the wind and the boisterous waves and all that, we can get wrapped up in that. I remember, um, heard a preacher in Bible college, he said there was a lady that would be sitting in her for, on her front porch daily as he walked by when he was in, I think he was in high school. And as he would walk, he'd see how she was doing and he got into a habit of asking her how she was doing. And so he said, he told us, he said, he's walking by and there she is. And he says, how you doing, Ms. So-and-so? And she said, poorly, thank God. 
Now, none of us likes to be doing poorly, but she was thanking God for everything she had. And you ever, you, you know, you ever stop to consider what we have? Don't you praise God? But we wind up in situations where if it's not the winds and the waves, it's the people and the place, it's something. And it gets our eyes off of him. I think that's what took place with Asaph. Go back to there. In his confusion, look at verse four. He's basically saying this. <laughs> these, these wicked, they seem blessed. Look at verse four. For there are, no, there are no bands in their death. A band, what he was talking about there, was a fetter. In other words, what he's saying is, there's no pain with them. There's no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Now he's using superlatives. Man, they got no problems, no bands, no trouble, no nothing. I'm sure they had it. People today, they're not completely, they're not completely satisfied uh, in the world. Again, that's why we have so many psychiatrists. That's why we're popping so many pills. But there are some, it seems like they're doing great. And meanwhile, I got a flat tire, or I got this, or I got, and you know, it's like, wow, whatever your parallel is in this, by the way. Whatever your parallel is, what your reality is, is what God is seeking to show you. They seem blessed, but then he says, but their behavior is wicked. Look at verse six. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment. They're literally, it seems to be wearing the wretchedness of their sin. It's part of them. It's what they're going forward in. Lord, somebody got on television a couple of weeks ago and was singing a song called Unholy. Lord, he needs to die. Wait a minute. We'll get there. Meanwhile, Asaph is saying, their behavior is wicked. On top of that, they're speaking blasphemies. Look at verse eight. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. I'm sure, I am absolutely sure that you know somebody just like that. In fact, maybe one day before you came to Christ, you were like that. But I mean, you couldn't get low enough in sin or these people can't get low enough in sin. And this day and age, the way things are going, I mean, it's like, yeah, I can see that. Have you noticed how wretched language has gotten, by the way, on both sides of the political aisle? You wanna just tell everybody collectively to shut up and clean your mouth. What happened, what happened to mom who put the soap in the mouth? Now the mom would probably be arrested for doing that. But seriously, I mean, no matter where you are, they're reveling in sin and they're blaspheming God about it. Look at verse nine, they set their mouth against the heavens. In other words, so much of what's coming out of there, they're cursing God. People curse God today and they don't even think about it. It's, it's God this and God that, and, and, and on a, I don't even wanna to allude to it, but the point is they're cursing God and not just in their language, but in their actions. Therefore, his people return hither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. The saints come 
and they talk about what has come, and they come again and again and again. They're burdened with what's happening. Time and again, God's people now in America are having to go to court to make sure they keep their religious freedom, to keep their family freedom. I'm not going to go into detail. There are so many stories that are going on. You just wind up setting that aside. I want the focus to be here. But look at verse 11. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? You know, you can take this from either way. On the one hand, there's the blasphemer. He's going, ha! How does God know? I got news for you. I've been living like this for years and I'm doing so much better than you are. And the saint goes to the Lord and says, Lord, can't, can't, can't you do anything? Lord, they are doing better than we are. Look, isn't there something you we have been praying that you would glorify yourself, lift yourself up, bring us revival, do whatever. Lord, we need you. And by the way, we need him. But are we gonna give up? Hang in there. You know, Sometimes we just want to call on instant judges, justice. Aren't you glad that God was merciful and patient with you? I'm reminded, though, of James and John, the sons of thunder. Luke 9, 53, Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem and something happens in verse 53, Luke 9, and they did not receive him, these Samaritans in the Samaritan village, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, <laughs> in their great patience, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Elias did it. Can we do it too? Read, can we nuke them? Can we blow them away? But he turned and rebuked them. You know not what manner of spirit ye are. Now, you know, that, that can kind of make us pause a little bit. Now, seriously. Lord, America needs judgment. But God, before you do that, could you save some more people? For the Son of Man has come not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Why the Lord has put up with us, I don't know. This nation is squarely in the realm of Sodom and Gomorrah. What is needed is not a song service, but the preaching of the gospel. Solid, repent or perish. Listen, that's what is needed here from coast to coast. That's going to take place, I pray, someday. But meanwhile, we need to keep praying. So they went on just to another village. Mentioned this during Sunday school. Roger Whiteside preached a gospel message yesterday. Praise God for it. There was a lot of remembrances about Ed. And finally, when he was able to get up, I pre he, he, he preached, I think, about 20 minutes. And remember, we were praying for this service. We did, and we continue to pray. And I was praying during the service. And I'm sure there were others as well from our church. You know how many people responded? Zero. But 
Everybody in this auditorium walked out with two things. The scripture in their head and the Holy Spirit who would convict them. It's all according to what they do, but this is the point. <laughs> Have you ever been at a time where you think, you know, Lord, are, 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 we go, are we doing anything? Please forgive me. Can I reminisce a little bit about something? Because this is when this, you know, it really struck my heart. I, I, I've told everybody about this, about the Christian concrete crew I was on. I wish I could take you back to examples of people that got the gospel God saved, you know, just, and, and sometimes the anger, you know, because you're, you're, you're talking about, you're talking about God. You know, I like to go bike riding. And I thought, I got to do something, you know, while I'm bike riding. So I, and you can buy these, by the way, on Amazon. Just got me, just this last week, just got me a t-shirt. Jesus saves. I can't wait to wear it at the, at the Dry Creek uh, place, you know, where I'm riding my bike. And I don't know if somebody's going to smack me for it or not. I don't know. Right now, I'm going to keep my coat button or zipped up because it's cold. But I remember, I, I, I'm telling you, I was in Brentwood, California, right next to Antioch. I was by myself. It was my last day on the job. And you know how Satan sometimes kind of wants to get to you? And all of a sudden, here I am. I'm going to be leaving. We're moving down to Santa Maria where Bernie and I got married. And I'm going to be working in that Christian school down there, teaching all the Bible classes for junior high and high school. I am really looking forward to it. But the thing is, is we were here, and it was so great just to see how the Lord used, especially my boss. But now it's over. The concrete crew is just kind of breaking apart. And I was working by myself. It was a place, it, 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 was, a, uh, it was a neighborhood we were, we were working on. All the foundations were pretty much down already. All the foundations were down. There was, the, no sticks were coming up yet, no walls. And so you could see for, you know, several streets, wherever. And I started to cry. I don't know, I just, you know, because it was, it was a move. I, you know, we're getting ready to go. And it was my, again, like I said, it was my last day on the job. I'm, I'm, getting, uh, I'm, I'm getting these, uh, these, these garages, I'm getting them leveled out and I'm getting the wire in them so they can pour them later on. I started to cry. It's like, Lord, did we make a difference? You know, you know Satan wants you to think you ain't doing squat. He wants you to think that you're making no impact on anybody anywhere. You ever been there? So here I am, getting things done. And, and I look up, and, 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 and two streets away from me, I start looking at a guy, and he's been looking at me. And I look at him, and he looks at me, look at him, and he looks at me. And finally, we just started walking towards each other. And I remembered him. He was a guy that I'd witnessed to just a little over two years before. And, you know, blown off, didn't hear much, you know, whatever. And, and, and that was it. He got saved. His wife got saved. And they were having Bible studies in their house. Yeah! That night, I went to the airport to pick up my mom. She was going to be riding with us. We were leaving literally the next day. And we went to, I went to Oakland Airport, picked mom up, and we're coming through the terminal, and a guy's walking towards me. It was one of the drivers for Kaiser Sand and Gravel, big company that we got a lot of our concrete from. And he looks at me, and he looks at him, oh, praise God, man, good to see you. 
He's the guy I think maybe I've told a few of you about. He's a trucker. He, he's driving again for Kaiser. But he was running for Mr. Middleweight California. The guy had 17-inch biceps. He was not a weakling. But he got saved. And he looked at his wife and said, this is one of the guys that helped bring me to Jesus. And I thought, thank you, Lord. It was not in vain. You listen to me. Like Asaph winds up finding out, like so many others are finding out, and maybe you have at one time or another. It is not in vain. It is not. By God's grace, Ted, in a week and a half, we're going to go down and see Giselle. That's you, brother. That's you encouraging her to follow the Lord. In two months, we're going to go see Antonio. By the way, when it comes to Giselle, we need to be able to take uh, a box what do you call those again? Care package. We can take a care package down. We've sent one to Antonio. But the point is this. Here's Roger Whiteside. He preaches yesterday. Nobody trusts Christ. But one day, somebody, somebody, I remember John Getch, when he was here, told the story that when the Olympics were in Salt Lake City, they grabbed some students and drove all the way from Lancaster and went up to Salt Lake. Nobody slept, you know, they're driving all night and they're passing out tracks. They're trying to, they're just getting dumped that nobody's paying attention to them. So they thought, well, let's go knock some doors. And so they knocked on doors. Nothing. They loaded up everybody in the bus, drove back all night the next night to get back to Lancaster. And Brother Getch says, we just wondered, why in the world did we go? Why in the world did we go? Several months went by. Somebody was over at a Christian lady's house and she looked at a picture of a young lady that this family had, and she goes, I know her. I know her. What? No, no, no. She's, she's not from out She says, no, I know her. She knocked on my door. We were living in Salt Lake. She gave a tract. I got saved. I never was able to tell her about that. They're going to a Bible preaching church. You know something, it pays, excuse me, it pays to be faithful. I want you to see, we're not finished with Asaph just yet. Look at verse 12. There's a challenge in perspective. Remember, we've met, you know, hey, they're, they're cursing you, God. You know, they're living wickedly. And it seems like they're doing great. Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Now to me, what he's coming up on now is his Lord, did we make a difference moment. Look at verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. Now again, this is the man that leads the singing in the temple. And he is telling people, I went through this. I cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He's saying this, okay, I'm following God. I'm laboring through the day. And guess what? I wake up in the morning and God's reminding me of my sin. I've got to be watching here and here. And it's like, Lord, they're out there having a ball. It doesn't matter. 
But then look what I'm going through, Lord. Now, I'm telling you, this, I mean, this is a moment of truth right here. This challenge in perspective. Look at verse 15. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. The kids right now, we don't have many, but the kids are over in junior church. There's also young people here. You know what kids do that really bug you? They watch. They watch. One of the hardest lessons, not a hard lesson, but it was like, oh my soul. One of the high schoolers that I taught when I was youth pastor down in Hollister, he wrote down, I think it was 36 of my idiosyncrasies. Now y'all are laughing. I'm gonna start writing down yours. I mean, things I would say, you know, this right here, you know, things I would do, and he nailed me to a T. You know why? He was watching. Children watch. Young people watch. And they notice when somebody starts drifting from the Lord. Oh, must not be real. Oh, I mean, you know, God doesn't do anything for you. Oh, well, I guess that's just the way it goes, huh? And they walk away from the Lord and we wonder why they do. What did they hear from us? What did they get from our life? Let me ask you, if just by the way we have lived, have we told others God's a God of love, that he answers our prayers? You, you gotta, you, you know, just, just think about it. Now, we can all look back, we can all look back, and we can see times when, you know, we could have done better. I mean, my soul, it's there. The point is this. Asaph is at the point where, again, it's like he's getting ready to walk out the door. He's, you know, this is it. This is the challenge. But the challenge when it comes to Asaph, the challenge in perspective winds up leading to a change in perspective. Do not ever forget this. You will find your answer when you get into the God place. Look at verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. You get out in the world and everybody's going, woohoo! You get into the word and you read, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You read the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You read about the rich man, Lazarus. Lazarus, Abraham's bosom. Heaven, forever. The rich man, he's still praying for his five brethren. He's doing something. But it's not what we'd want to be doing. You get into the God place until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. All of a sudden, the entire Focus changes. He realizes something, and I'm almost done. He realizes he's not in the slippery place. 
they are. Look at verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. The same people that are having a ball right now are going to be wide-eyed with terror one day. And I do not say that flippantly. I do not say that flippantly. As a dream, when one waketh, so, O oh Lord, when thou wast awake, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. Verse 22, so foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. In other words, Lord, I, I, I confess right now, I didn't know what I was talking about. Oh, my soul. And that's when his confidence returns. And we'll see that next Sunday morning. But it could be that either you yourself or somebody else that you know, their confidence has collapsed. Folks, we need to remind ourselves and each other we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And all God's people said, that is where we're at by God's grace.